Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. Today I want to talk about the plain truth about heaven. Did early Christians believe that they would go to heaven upon death? What's the plain truth about heaven? If Christians didn't believe that, what did they believe? What did they understand? In the old Plain Truth magazine, back in 1955, the late Pastor General of the old Radio Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, wrote the following. What assurance have we that our departed loved ones have gone to heaven? By what authority have we believed that we shall go to heaven if we've been saved? He said this might be a bit shocking. I want to ask a candid question. Do you ever look into your Bible to see whether or not it really says that you go to heaven if you're saved? Have you looked in the Bible to see what it reveals the saved are going to inherit throughout all eternity? He says, it's going to surprise most of you to realize that you never did. Of course, you probably heard you go to heaven. Now, when Herbert Armstrong wrote all this, most of the United States was professed Christianity and believed that they would go to heaven upon death. Nowadays, not so much. People are even less biblically literate than when he wrote this. He says, of course, you've heard you're going to heaven. If you're saved, you just accepted it probably. But did you ever stop to prove it? Of course, the Bible says in Thessalonians, Apostle Paul wrote, prove all things, hold fast what is good. He says, if you look in your Bible, he said, you'd be surprised. He said, God makes a promise. He says, it was uh, in, uh, down to Abraham, this is from Galatians, and the seed where the promise is made. And if you be Christ, and you're Abraham's seed, then heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3. But the Christian is not yet the possessor of this reward. You're an heir. You're one who will inherit if saved. The promise made to Abraham. Now what will be the reward of the saved? And where we can spend eternity? If saved, what's the specific promise from God? So the promise was given to Abraham, who's called, in the book of Galatians, the father of the faithful. And if one's converted, whether Jew or Gentile, regardless of race, color, or sex, if one's Christ, he, one becomes one of Abraham's children and heirs to the promise made to Abraham. So it says you can read in Acts chapter 3, verse 13, the inspired words of the apostle Peter. The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son, Jesus. So if you're Christ, if you're a Christian, then you're an heir to inherit. Not what people might devise in their own imaginations. You're an heir. You're going to inherit something. And you're going to inherit what was promised. Not something else. And the promise, he said, that he wrote here, was made to Abraham, was important. Whatever it is, that's what you're going to inherit. Then Herbert Armstrong cites uh, Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse 14. And the Eternal said to Abram, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give you and your seed forever. And that's the lands where Abram was. Uh, the land of Canaan called Israel today, that is the promised land. That's why it's called the promised land. And for how long? Forever. Then he cites uh, Galatians 3, verse 29. And if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seeds, seed and heirs according to the promise. And the promise, the promise of eternal inheritance, is, is the land of Israel here on the earth. God helps us put our trust in the sure word of God, not in fables of men. Incidentally, other scriptures show that the territory of Christ's kingdom is to expand and spread ultimately to include the entire earth. So that's some of what Herbert Armstrong wrote. But some might say, well, he still thinks the promise, or thought the promise was uh, heaven. But early Christians did not teach they were going to heaven as a reward. Now, scholars have looked into this and in the Bible and church history have come to the conclusion that, well, actually, early Christians didn't believe this. So here's an article from the Huffington Post. It said, the off-cliched Christian notion of heaven 
a blissful realm of harps drumming angels, has remained a fixture of the faith for centuries. But scholars on the right and the left increasingly say that this belief has no basis in the Bible and it would have sounded bizarre to Jesus and his early followers. Then they're referring to uh, N.T. Wright, a former Anglican bishop uh, who teaches uh, at Scotland University. It says, the majority of the conventional view of heaven is very different from what we find in the biblical testimonies. So this is not a Church of God writer, such as myself or Herbert Armstrong, uh, but also from uh, Christopher Moore of Union Theological Seminary in New York. So th these two, Wright and Moore, worked independently of each other. And it says, in classic Judaism and first century Christianity, believers expected the world would be transform into God's kingdom. A restored Eden where redeemed human beings will be liberated from death, illness, sin, and other corruptions. Uh, the other th part of it was in the first century they believed uh, the kingdom would be practicing social justice, nonviolence, and forgiveness. It's not so a platonic, timeless eternity, which we are all taught. It's definitely a time where God will utterly transform this world, according to uh, Dr. Wright. Now, as far as a platonic, timeless eternity, officially many Protestant denominations and the Roman Catholic Church teach that your purpose, if you're saved, is to look at God and have the beatific vision, they call it, for eternity. Now, we go over that in a free booklet we have here I'm holding up called The Mystery of God's Plan. Why did God create anything? Why did God make you? We quote various ones who believe that and explain why biblically that is not the case. That is not God's plan for you. But people have heard it long enough and you hear the same lie often or fable often enough, people just tend to believe it. Now this booklet and any other book that I hold up other than perhaps my Bible or my notes are available free online at ccug.org. Go to the literature tab, click under books and booklets, you'll see the covers, of some descriptions of our booklets or books. We do not ask for your email address, we don't ask for anything. So just be, but we do request that you read the literature and compare what's written in your Bible to what we teach to see if this is in fact so. But anyway, so it's interesting to me that Dr. Wright realized that no, what he was taught was simply not the case. And then there's one by the name of uh, Rob uh, Bell, uh, who talks about that there's going to be resurrected bodies in the context of a new heaven and a new earth, which is exactly what the Bible teaches. And then some others are listed here, uh, Howard Snyder and Joel Scandrid, make the extended argument that people are going to be transformed and there's going to be a new earth. And then they say that uh, not only does Apostle Paul teach it, but 2 Peter 3.13 reads in accordance with his God's promise, we wait new heavens and new earth where righteousness is at home. And this is an article, uh, again, talking about some scholars. So a lot of scholars do know this. Uh, getting back to Dr. Wright, he said one of the central stories of the Bible is that there's a heaven and the earth and human souls have been exiled, exiled from heaven and they're serving out time on the earth until they return. Indeed, for most modern Christians, the idea of going to heaven when you die uh, is not simply one belief amongst other, but it seems to be the one that all tend to accept. But since so that's simply not the case, the followers of the early Jesus movement believed the point was not for us to go to heaven, but for the life of heaven to arrive on earth. And he said, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come on earth as is in heaven. That would be in Matthew 6. But from the early as the 3rd century, not the 1st century, which is Jesus was here, not the 2nd century, where the people who knew the apostles or others who knew Jesus were around, but not until the 3rd century, some teachers, now he called them Christians, I would not call them that, tried to blend this with types of 
Platonic belief, teachings of Plato, Greek philosophy, generating the idea of leaving the earth and going to heaven. And that became mainstream in the Middle Ages. But Jesus' first followers never went that route. Again, this is from Dr. Wright. What then does the personal hope of Jesus' followers? Ultimately a resurrection, a new and immortal physical body and God's new creation. But after death and before that final reality, a period of blissful rest. Now, one thing I guess I should interject is Christians, when they're resurrected, will have spirit bodies, but others will have physical bodies when they're, when they're resurrected and on the earth. Anyway, the modern idea of going to heaven upon death simply was not something that early Christians believed. Now, one former evangelical, and I'll say he's probably an agnostic, Dr. Bart Ehrman, uh, he wrote that early Christians of the first century believed the kingdom of God was coming to the earth, and they looked forward to a divine future on the earth. But he postulated, because it didn't happen in the lifetime of the first century Christians, that the Greco-Roman professors of Christ then decided to go more for an immediate reward of heaven upon uh, uh, death. So that's what he wrote about. And there's no question, by the way, early Christians did not teach you go to heaven upon death. But they taught that to be part of the coming kingdom of God. Now, some have uh, said that, you know, those who are died and believe in Christ are right now uh, in heaven, watching down over us or strumming harps or whatever. Now, even though the person I'm about to quote had heretical views, Justin Martyr, who's considered to be a saint, by the way, by uh, uh, Roman Catholic, Greco-Roman Catholics, uh, as well as uh, Protestants, they consider him a great saint, but we in the Church of God actually don't. But in the second century, here is what uh, Justin said. He said, If you have fallen in with some who are called Christians, but don't admit this truth, and venture to blaspheme the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, so it's kind of interesting, he's bringing in indirectly the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which Herbert Armstrong talked about. He said, Those who say there is no resurrection of the dead, and that their souls, when they die, are taken to heaven, do not imagine that they are Christians. Now this is from Justin Martyr, a uh, Greco-Roman uh, saint. Uh, by the way, we have books, fairly thick books, on uh, Protestantism and uh, the Catholic Church. What did the original Catholic Church believe? And so this particular book that I'm shaking here, on well, Protestants, again, they're all also available at ccg.org, which quotes Protestant scholars, Protestant uh, accepted historical writings, and uh, Protestant translations of the Bible show that what passed for modern Protestantism did not exist. Early Christians were nothing like uh, modern Protestants. And you'd say, well, then they were like the Greco-Roman Catholics. No, this particular book, which primarily uses uh, Greco-Roman Catholic translations of the Bible, uh, refers to Greco-Roman saints and writers, and Greco-Roman accepted historia, historical information, demonstrates that, uh, no, what the Greco-Roman Catholic churches now do is not, what they teach is not what early Christians taught, which in this case, what we're focused on is the idea of heaven. So no, the early Christians did not believe you would go to heaven upon death, and you can again read this in these books, which I encourage you to read both, whether you're Catholic or Protestant, you should or were either one, or, or currently in the Church of God, I recommend you read them all because this way you get a better idea of why the Church of God is not Protestant and why or what church actually has the teachings of the original Catholic Church. Because it's not the Church of Rome and it's not the, the Eastern Orthodox. Now, I read what Justin Martyr said, again, which is, those who say there is no resurrection of the dead and their souls when they die are taken to heaven do not imagine they're Christians. Now, the, the Roman Catholics do teach a resurrection of the dead, but they also teach something different as far as heaven goes. It says, those who die in God's grace and fellowship and are perfectly purified live forever with Christ. They see him as he is, face to face. That's getting back to beatific vision, which we go to in those books as well as this much thinner book. 
by virtue of our apostolic authority, the Church of Rome saying it has, and by the way, we, the continuing Church of God, have apostolic authority and uh, have apostolic succession, which is, by the way, documented in this book. According to the general disposition of God, the souls of all the saints and other faithful who died after receiving Christ's holy baptism, provided they don't need additional purification, uh, they take their bodies up again to general, then general judgment, and they will be in heaven, in the heavenly kingdom, the, and celestial paradise with Christ, joining the company of the holy angels. Since the death of our Lord, these souls have seen and see the divine essence in an intuitive vision, even face to face, without the mediation of any creature. So what the Catholic Catechism, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, is that they claim apostolic authority, that yes, people who died, they are, their, their souls go to heaven and they are seeing God face to face. Early Catholics did not teach this, and the beatific vision is not God's plan. It's not that those who are uh, resurrected and come uh, back to life after Jesus returns will not see God. They will, but that's not what the purpose of life is. It's more, it's more than that. Anyway, as far as apostles, apostles and their teaching goes, you might want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Apostle Paul said that the time of his death was about at hand. Verse 7, he fought a good fight. He finished the race. He's kept the faith. Verse 8. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Now, he's talking about the day he dies. No. And not me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. So Paul is specifically saying, we don't get this. He doesn't get it. And he is an apostle. He's an apostolic teacher here until Jesus comes and returns. Now let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting verse 13. A lot of people are very familiar with these passages of Scripture. So, because Paul again tells what happens to people who die. Verse 13, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, about uh, those who fall asleep. Don't sorrow like those who don't have any hope. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So those who died as Christians, real Christians. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So Paul says, I'm not making this up. Jesus said this, that we who are alive and will remain until the coming of the Lord won't by any means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Therefore, we'll always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, some say, ah, we meet the Lord in the air, we'll always be with the Lord. He's in the air. Yes, but he's coming to the earth. Anyway, those who believe that their loved ones died are now looking down on heaven from them. They're in error. Now, Polycarp of Smyrna, and that's actually a statue that's supposed to be Polycarp of Smyrna on this particular book. Same statue is also on this one. That's Martin Luther. Um, he was put in charge. He's an apostolic successor. He was put in charge, believed by the Apostle John and some uh, others, probably Philip, maybe even Peter. He says, knowing this, that God is not mocked, we ought to walk worthy of his commandment and glory, for it's well that they should be cut off for the less of the world. Uh, for fornicators, abusers themselves with mankind shall not inherit the kingdom of God, nor those who think they're uh, inconsistent, unbecoming. Now, Polycarp taught Christians would inherit the kingdom of God. And he was quoting 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. He says, don't you know that unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor extortioners, or revilers will inherit the kingdom of God. And uh, the Apostle Paul wrote basically the same types of things in Galatians 5, verses uh, uh, 15, excuse me, 19 to 21. And getting back to Paul, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, why don't we go there, starting verse 50.
1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, which has not happened yet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal on immortality. Now, getting back to Polycarp, when they were killing him, this, I'm going to read something from the, what's called the martyrdom of Polycarp. Polycarp said, You have granted me this day and this hour that I might receive a portion among the number of the martyrs in the cup of Christ unto resurrection of eternal life, both of soul and body, in the incorruptibility of the Holy Spirit. So this is what Polycarp said. Now get this. I went into what's called Bing Copilot, which is their artificial intelligence this week, and I kept asking, what is the earliest post-New Testament writing supposedly asserting that Christians went to heaven upon death? So I kept going over and over again. They kept giving me wrong stuff, wrong stuff, or nothing useful. Then finally, this was what I just read was quoted as the earliest proof that early Christians believed they would go to heaven. But I just read you what Polycarp said. He didn't say anything about going to heaven. He said he was looking forward to the resurrection of eternal life. Furthermore, when I was with being co-pilot, they kept saying, that, yeah, the Bible teaches heaven. But it didn't. It just basically, when you read what being co-pilot actually said, it was, well, it's implied by this, implied by this. No, no, never had to actually was there. And so it wouldn't, it wouldn't give me the answers to the question I wanted, which is I wanted to quote something from perhaps the 3rd or 4th century. But it did, by the way, refer me to Dr. Uh, N.T. Wright's works, but I'd already read those, and the ones that I read to you, I didn't get those from being AI, I ran across those years ago. Well, anyway, in the 1st century, there's an anonymous document, sometimes called First Clement, that said, the apostles received the gospel for us from the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was sent forth from God. So then Christ is from God and the apostles are from Christ. Both therefore came to the will of God in the appointed order. Having therefore received a charge and having been fully assured to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and confirmed in the word of God with full assurance of the Holy Ghost, they went forth with the glad tidings that the kingdom of God should come. That's right, the kingdom of God will come when Jesus returns. While Greek philosophers like Plato and those who held to the sun god worship being religion of Mithraism taught about going to heaven. The reality that is going to heaven was not the teaching of the New Testament nor the early Christians. It's simply they taught the resurrection. Now, according to the Protestant publication calling itself Christianity Today, the first references to heaven from people who were supposed to be Christians uh, came from uh, a source in the 3rd century and one in the uh, 2nd century. So here's something from Christianity Today. It said, For thoughtful Christians, what did early, they want to know, what did early church believe about heaven? And it says, uh, not only was heaven a place that's populated, and Christians look forward to coming uh, to communing after death, not only with God, but with each other. The earliest evidence of this trend is the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicia, Felicity. Uh, two Christian women, supposedly, killed in Carthage, North Africa, around, early, around 202 or 203 AD, which is the early 3rd century. This dream recorded this book records a dream she had in prison before she and her companions were thrown to wild beasts. In the dream, she saw her sickly brother, who died at age seven, in heaven, drinking from the fountain of life. Okay. And this was, the, this was a widely circulated book, and it may well have shaped many early Christians' visions of eternal, their eternal reward. But they didn't get that from heaven. They get uh, from, from the Bible. Then you have them for the Bible. They got this from a dream that Perpetua claimed to have that somebody wrote about in the third century. 
and from the second century, Clement of Alexandria, who the uh, late Pope Benedict the Sixteenth said uh, had Gnostic tendencies, he also claimed heaven. So from somebody from the late second century and somebody from the early third century, the Greco-Roman Catholics started to pick up heaven. But they didn't get it from the Bible. They didn't get it from the early professors of, uh, from Christ. Yeah. Even uh, the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia says Clement of Alexandria was infected with uh, uh, Gnosticism. And, Roman, and even uh, Protestant scholars have also said the same thing about him. And here's something from a, an SDA scholar written around 1890. Clement, the most famous Alexandrian college faculty and teacher of origin, boasted he would not teach Christianity unless it was mixed with pagan philosophy. And that's basically where heaven came from. You've got people like Clement who picked it up from the Greeks, and then you've got whoever wrote the uh, uh, martyrdom of uh, perpetual uh, felicity, and the same thing. They didn't get it from the Bible. Now, that being said, I think it's from the writings of the apostate Irenaeus that we see it's taught that some went to heaven. And this would be the late second century. He, he, he says, as the presbyters say, those who are deemed worthy of abode in heaven shall go there. Others shall enjoy the delights of paradise, and others possess the splendor of the city, for everywhere the Savior shall be seen. So there's, there's a distinguishment between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold, those who produce sixtyfold, and those who produce thirtyfold. The first will be kept enough to heavens, the second will dwell in paradise, the last will have the city. Okay? That's nonsense. The Bible does not teach that. Okay? This is another uh, false thing that uh, various ones have. And this partially ended up evolving into this idea that people who are purified, ready as the uh, catechisms of the Catholic Church say, they go to heaven. Those not go to some place to be purified before, which they call a, a, a purgatory. And uh, that was also not the teaching of the original uh, Catholic Church. Now, while I do go into this idea of uh, purgatory in this particular book, in this particular one, book, Universal Offer of Salvation, I go into more where purgatory came from and what it changed, was a change of belief from. Early Christians did not believe in a place like purgatory. They did believe uh, in what was called apocatastasis, we go into great depth in this particular book. Various scholars, including Greco-Roman Catholic ones, admit that that was also the teachings of the original church. But uh, So when Irenaeus is talking about these different levels and such, uh, that simply was not the original belief. Now, as far as what Irenaeus wrote, even Greek Orthodox bishops have written, quote, relevant details given by Irenaeus of Lyon are proved to be baseless and untrue. And this is because these details are obviously based on apocryphal texts and inaccurate sources. So this is actually a letter to uh, Pope Francis from the uh, uh, Orthodox uh, Catholic Church of Greece. He had mentioned that about Irenaeus, and I just read you some things here. Now, what I've noticed within the Protestant world is they have... Uh, some of them believe that these near-death experiences uh, have to do with going to heaven. And other Protestants, however, wisely conclude that's not the case. There was a film released in 2014 called Heaven is for Real. It involved a four-year-old by the name of Colton Burpo. He got through an emergency appendectomy, and people didn't think he would survive. And then he uh, said that uh, he went to heaven and back. He says he met his uh, miscarried sister, who no one told him about. His great-grandfather died 30 years before he was born. And he shared supposedly impossible to know details. And he went on to describe the horse that only Jesus could ride and how really big God and his chair were and how the Holy Spirit shoots down power from heaven to help people. 
Now, of course, heaven is for real because that's where God's throne now is, Matthew uh, 5, verse 34. But Colton did not go there. Here's a commentary on this movie, uh, Heaven for Real. It says, four biblical authors had visions of heaven. They were not near-death experiences. He mentioned Isaiah, Ezekiel, prophets from the Old Testament, Apostle Paul and Apostle John. Two biblical figures, Micaiah and Stephen got glimpses, but that wasn't described. Of the three who later wrote about what they saw, the details were pretty sparse. They all focused on God's glory. They had nothing to say about features prominent in modern tales about heaven. Things like picnics, games, juvenile attractions, familiar faces, odd conversations, and so forth. Paul gave no actual description of heaven, but simply said he saw what things would be unlawful to utter. In short, the biblical description of heaven could hardly be any more different from today's fanciful stories about heaven, which again, frequently you see in, in the Protestant media. Now in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5, by the way, the Bible says, the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And in Job 14 verse 14, Job says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my heart service, I will wait until my change comes. When does that change come? At the resurrection. The Bible doesn't teach the idea of near-death experience or going to heaven. And then there was another one. There was another book called The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven. It was a best-selling book. It was first published in 2010. Uh, Alex says he was in a coma when he was six years old. lasted two months. And he, and, uh, he tells all kinds of stories about it. But later he admitted... I didn't die, I did not go to heaven. He says, I, went, I said I went to heaven because I thought it would give me attention. When I made the claims I did, I never even read the Bible. People profited from lies and continue to do so. They should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Anything written by man can be infallible. So this is one of the other ones. The Protestant world will jump down this. See, this is proof of heaven. And it's like, no, it's not. Um, now, as far as a view, another view about heaven... Uh, Joseph uh, Farah, who's the uh, Protestant editor, and he's a, like a messianic, the World News Daily wrote, the, uh, the Apostle Simon Peter is quoted in Acts 3.24 saying, He shall send Jesus Christ, which is preached to you, whom heaven must receive, until the restitution, the apocryphatostasis, of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the father of the prophet, shall the Lord raise up unto your brethren like to me, and you'll hear in all things whatever he says to you. It has come to pass that every soul that won't hear that prophet shall be destroyed among the people. Yea, all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many have spoken, likewise told of these times. Pharaoh points out that this is referring to the return of Jesus where he established the kingdom for a thousand years, and in Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6, where the resurrection of the dead takes place. The first resurrection after Jesus comes, and where the martyrs will, and the resurrected Christians will live and reign for a thousand years. And the rest of the dead don't come until a thousand years is finished. Pharaoh points out there's a problem with John 3.13. says, which says, Jesus said, No man ascended to heaven except he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Pharaoh notes, John wrote this many decades after the resurrection of Jesus. At that time, he tells us, No one ascended to heaven except Jesus. If no earthly man ascended to heaven in the late first century, why do we assume any ascents ascended? Now, of course, Jesus said that in the early first century. But yes, if people were sending to heaven afterwards, you think God would have inspired John to say, okay, that was true when Jesus said it, but later, after he was resurrected, everybody went to heaven, but that is not the case. And then he talked about the uh, thief of the cross, said Jesus did not ascend to heaven the day he died, and uh, so this thief did not. He says, Jesus basically said, therefore I'm telling you today, you will be with me in paradise. And let's see. 
Um, he, uh, Pharaoh also brings up some other scriptures, such as Jesus says in Matthew 16, verse 9, to, to Peter, I'll give you the keys, kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth, we bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, we loose in heaven. This seems to be a promise of believers of a power life, powerful life in the kingdom of heaven, according to Pharaoh. But he also cites Acts 2, verses 34 to 35, written in the first century, long after the res uh, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Well, it was written, it may have been written long afterwards, but it was stated not too long after Jesus was resurrected. For David does not ascend it into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord says to my Lord, you shall sit my right hand and make the earth a footstool. If even King David, a man after the Lord's own heart, is not in heaven, how can we think others are? And Pharaoh points out various other things. Uh, Jesus prayed, said, Pray our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Will be, your will be done on earth as in heaven. He says, Nowhere in this Bible does it unequivocally state that heaven is the destination of man, says Pharaoh. But all the prophets speak of this kingdom of God on earth. And I talked about the millennial kingdom in here. Uh, then he also cites Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days will come, says the Lord, that I'll raise up unto David a righteous branch, a king who will reign and prosper and shall execute justice and judgment in the earth. He cites, I'm skipping over some, but he cites uh, Revelation 5, verse 10. And you have made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So that's from the New Testament. And Revelation 11, verse 15. If you're in Revelation, you might want to go there. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, what does the Bible say about heaven? Now, I went and saw, uh, went back to the Catholic Encyclopedia of 1910, I looked at it, and it says, heaven, in scriptures, heaven is called the king of heaven, the kingdom of God, the king of the Father, the kingdom of Christ, the house of the Father, the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the holy place, paradise, life, life everlasting, the joy of the Lord, crown of life, crown of justice, crown of glory, incorruptible crown, great reward, inheritance of Christ, eternal inheritance. The plain truth, the Bible doesn't call most of these heaven. You know, paradise, yes, but the rest of these are just saying that to try to say that the Bible teaches that you go to heaven upon death, which it does not do. Now let's go to 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 12. The Bible itself teaches that there will be that there are actually three heavens. We know this because of the writings from the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 1. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So these seem to be dreams and other revelations he's had. I know a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether the body I don't know or other body I don't know, God knows. Such as one caught up to the third heaven. So there must be three heavens we wouldn't have said that. Verse 4, I was cut up into paradise. Again, paradise, uh, in that case, being heaven, the third heaven. Here are inexpressible words which are not lawful for man to utter. Okay, so Paul talked about that. And the third heaven is where God's throne is. Uh, you don't have to go there, but I'm going to the Psalms. Psalm 11, verse 4 says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Okay? His eyes behold and his eyelids test the sons of men. In Psalm 103, verse 19, we read, The Lord has established his throne in heaven. His kingdom rules over all. And in the prayer Jesus said to pray, we just read Matthew 6, 9 and 10, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, and earth is in heaven. The Bible refers to the kingdom of heaven uh, and Matthew, in particular, uses this interchangeably with the kingdom of God. Partially because of the kingdom of heaven statements, some misunderstand that kingdom. 
while it's in heaven, now it's going to come to the earth. We can read about that. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21 and uh, start reading verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven uh, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the holy city is prepared for us. It's going to come down from heaven to the earth. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and he, they shall be his people. So God is coming down to the earth. The idea of a beatific vision up in heaven, you're going to see God, God's coming down here. God himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain for the former things that passed away. You know, Jesus taught, no man, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, the Son of Man, who is in heaven, of John 3, verse 13. Jesus indeed came down from heaven to be here on the earth. But he did return later to the throne of his father, John 20, verse 17. But he also taught no one else did. Uh, Joseph Farah mentioned uh, uh, the patriarch David, so I won't reread that, but you can read about that in Acts 2, verses 29 to 35. David has not ascended into heavens. He's a man after God's own heart. He's awaiting the resurrection. Now, some have wondered about Jesus' statement in John 14, going to verses 2 to 3. We, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. I'll come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. So people say, well, Jesus is in heaven, therefore that's where they're going. Yeah, but Jesus is coming down from heaven, and the holy city of New Jerusalem is coming down from heaven. Now, the late uh, evangelist, Dr. Herman Hay, uh, the word that uh, says the Greek word move, translated mansion, means, in more modern English, a room or place to stay. Uh, but it also means like a chamber. And as far as the Father's house, the temple in Jerusalem was the Father's house according to Jesus. It was a type of Father's house in heaven. But did the old temple have many mansions or rooms with it, chambers in it? Yes. And in Jeremiah 35, verse 2, we read about the house of the Lord in the various chambers. And in the fourth verse, the same chapter, we read the different chambers for people of different ranks. So there will be different ranks in the different chambers. But that's what the Bible teaches. It doesn't talk about the same way Irenaeus was teaching it. Now, nowhere does the Bible call heaven the Father's house. Its house is being built in heaven, but it's not heaven. All right, and... Uh, I read uh, Revelation 21 already, so I'm not going to reread that here. But again, it says that the Holy City of New Jerusalem is coming down. Now, I mentioned that there were three heavens. So there's two other ones the Bible talks about. One is in Genesis 1 1, where it says, uh, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He was already in the third heaven. In verse uh, 7 of Genesis 1, we read, God made a firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters and firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And it was the evening and the morning and the second day. So we see uh, different heavens, uh, basically like where the clouds are, and then outer space, and then where God's throne is. Those are the three. In uh, Deuteronomy 10, 14, we also read about multiple heavens. It says, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth and all that's in it. So this is also, again, indication of three heavens. Uh, heaven where the clouds is, heaven above that, being the highest heavens, and where God's throne is, those two. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, we read, uh, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heavens... Heaven of heavens cannot contain you. 
In other words, uh, this had to do with, with the temple being built and saying, well, God is bigger than just that or the earth or everything else. He's bigger than everything. That's true, but the Bible again says God will dwell on the earth. But again, we see multiple heavens mentioned. You can also read about uh, multiple heavens in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. I won't go there. And as far as the identification of other heavens, Psalm uh, 78, verse 23 says, Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven, and he rained down manna for them to eat, gave them the bread of heaven. So again, that's the first heaven. And you can read about that also in Daniel 4, verse 15. Let, in the tender grass of the field, let, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Well, dew of heaven happens when the clouds come down, uh, which again, part of the first heaven. And we also read in Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 through 12, that the windows of heaven opened and rain came down. Again, the first heaven where the clouds are. And this... Uh, second heaven, we read about Genesis uh, 15, verse 15, the heaven and the, and, the, and the stars. And in Deuteronomy 10, verse 22, it talks about the stars of heaven. And then in Deuteronomy 17, verse 3, it talks about the sun, the moon, and the host of heaven. Isaiah 13, verse 10. By the way, I have an article at cogwriter.com that has all these in here. I go over too fast. For the stars of heaven and their constellation. And in Revelation 9, verse 1, we read about uh, the fifth angel sounding and a star from heaven will go to the earth. So the Bible talks about three heavens in multiple places. Okay? Again, the first one where the clouds are, the second one where the stars are, the uh, third one, which is, to use a modern term, probably a different type of, a different dimension of a different type, the spiritual dimension, uh, the third heaven. And again, God says he however, will come down from that heaven to, to the earth. Now, some have wondered about the 24 elders of Revelation chapter 5. And I'm noticing how many pages that I have on that. Um, that uh, if you are curious about that, I don't think I want to go over this in this particular sermon. Uh, if you're curious about that, um, I would recommend you go to uh, the cogwriter.com website. I have an article there called, Did Early Christians Teach They Were Going to Heaven? Because I go through, this is one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, uh, five and a half, I have five and a half pages where I go over that, uh, where I'm reading multiple translations. So if you wonder about that, you can go do that. Now, there are certain passages that people have pointed to that claim that uh, humans are already in heaven and they're there. So does the Bible teach that exactly? Well, one passage is uh, Revelation 19, verse 1. So let me... Uh, uh, read about this. This is, I'm going to read this from the old uh, personal correspondence department letter from the old uh, Radio Worldwide Church of God. It says, Thank you for your question regarding Revelation 19, verse 1, which speaks of much people in heaven. So this is an unfortunate translate, mistranslation of the Greek word oklos. The word can mean people, but it can mean other things. Since the Bible elsewhere plainly tells us the reward of the saved is this earth, not heaven, this, um, some other translation should have been used. The Good Speed Translation, Revised Standard Translation, render oklos as multitude. Moffat Translation renders it as host, while the Amplified Numeric New Testament call it crowd. These translations best convey the meaning of the original Greek. Thus, the so called people. Of Revelation 19.1 are actually the crowd of the host of multitude of heaven. This is speaking of angels who are in heaven. They are the great multitude that sings forth praises to God, which you can read about in Revelation 5, verses 11 through 12. And while the old King James got it wrong, the new King James translates Revelation 19.1 as 
After these things, I heard a loud voice, a great multitude in heaven, saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor belong to our Lord and our God. Now, I've done a message before about uh, the old King James translation of the Bible. There are some out there who stubbornly believe that that translation is perfect, it is correct, and God approved every word in that, and that's simply not the case. There's no biblical basis for it. And to be blunt, I do not believe God would have inspired translators to uh, switch the word Passover, or Pascha in Greek, and translate it as Istar, which is the name of a Babylonian goddess, which they did one time in the King James Version of the Bible, and there are other mistranslations. Okay, so people who want to uh, hang their hat on that are not believing the Bible, because the Bible does not say that the, the, all translators can be uh, understood. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah, it warns that uh, they'll be stumbling, stutter, uh, you know, what I'm doing right now, stuttering lips. <laughs> So, so there'll, there'll be some translation errors that you have to deal with those, but instead people have changed their mind. Uh, but anyway, the Bible does not teach that there are multitudes of people currently in heaven. Now, some have also pointed to uh, Philippians 3.20, when the old King James says, our conversation is in heaven. We also look for our Savior, our Lord Jesus. Now, the word for conversation is a Greek word, uh, logi, and, uh, and it's mistranslated as conversation. It has to do with our citizenship uh, in heaven, and that's what the new King James says. And that's also consistent how even the old King James, I think, translated in Luke 17, verse 21. One of the things I've noticed when I looked at the old King James version of the Bible is they were inconsistent. So some of the translators would translate the word one way here, one way there, in the same type of context. It's like it didn't have to be different, but they would do it to promote some particular uh, doctrinal position that they wanted everybody to believe. Anyway, because New Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven, as we read in Revelation 21, and we're not of this world, as Jesus said in John 15, verse 19, our citizenship resides in heaven. Why? Because we Christians are now the people of God. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. But you are a chosen, oh, starting verse 9, 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his, as Jesus' special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but now are the people of God. God's in heaven, so our citizenship is there. Who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. Since God's throne is in heaven, that's where our citizenship currently resides. What about Moses and Elijah? People wondered about that. Let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Starting verse 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led him to a high mountain by themselves. And he, that's Jesus, was transfigured uh, before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with Jesus, him. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here, if you wish. Let's make us three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed him, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This, Jesus, meaning, is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one with Jesus but Jesus only. Now when they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell this vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Now Jesus called it a vision. So he was not showing people who were populating heaven. Now this doesn't mean that after the resurrection, spirit beings 
uh, will not be able to visit the new heaven that the Bible talks about. It's just that heaven itself is not the reward of the saved. The reality is that the Gnostic and pagan religions taught that heaven was rewarded as the same. They thought everything in the flesh was bad, therefore uh, you've got to go somewhere where there's no flesh, and that was the basic idea. But God's plan was different than that. Uh, the, the reason we have problems now isn't because we're flesh, although that uh, uh, being in flesh does play a role. But if people would obey God, things could be on earth as in heaven. I did a sermon recently on the Eighth Commandment. We have a booklet on the Ten Commandments. Um, and I explaining why the earth would be so much better if people would actually keep the Ten Commandments, particularly the Eighth One, which has to do with stealing and cheating, whatever. If, if humans would do things God way, God's way now, uh, there would be a type of paradise on the earth, uh, pretty much like Eden. And something like that will happen after Jesus returns. But the Gnostics and the pagans don't believe you're supposed to keep the ten, God's Ten Commandments. Now I'd like to read something related to a Gnostic group that was condemned by the uh, Roman Catholic Saint Hippolytus in the early 3rd century. He says, I think the, the four preceding books I have heavily elaborated explain the opinions propounded by all the speculators among the Greeks and the barbarians respecting the divine nature and the creation of the world. In the remainder of our work, the opportunity invites us to approach the treatment of our proposed subjects and to begin from those who have presumed to celebrate as serpent, the originator of, of the error in question, through expressions devised by the energy of his own ingenuity. The priests then, and champions of the system, have those been first who've been called Nasani, I guess, N A A S S E N I. They magnify the cause of all things. For Osiris, which is one of the Egyptian gods, the Nalasian say, is in the temples in the front of Isis and looks downward of all the fruits that he's done. And he affirms not only the most hallowed temples achieve the idols, but it talks about the dwelling of the good entity. And the Greeks derived this mystical expression from the Egyptians, preserving it to this day. And there are such opinions that these marvelous Gnostics, inventors of novel grammatical art, honor, magnify Homer as their prophet, he was a Greek writer, uh, uh, who after the mode adopted the mysteries announcing these truths. They talk about the resurrection takes place through the gate of heaven. And, they, uh, and those who enter don't remain dead. They're spiritual. He says uh, he becomes God when he rises from the dead. He'll enter heaven through a gate of this kind. Now we hear about the pearly gates of heaven. But the Bible doesn't say anything about Peter being by the pearly gates of heaven or anything. Now they claim that Paul the Apostle knew of this gate calling it a mystery. But these, he says, talk about secret mysteries, which are words of a human wisdom, not taught by the Spirit of God. So, Apollos was also condemning those who were talking about your, when you die, your soul goes to heaven. And he says that uh, they got this from the Egyptians, who then passed it on to the Greek scholars, and then the Greek scholars passed it on to, to others. Now, probably the pagan religion that most affected the Greco-Roman uh, non-churches of God face in the 4th century was Mithraism. Uh, the Roman Emperor Constantine had been a follower of the sun god Mithras, and he wanted the uh, Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholics to adopt uh, many beliefs of that faith. Now, I'm going to read something from a Roman Catholic writer about Mithraism. To attain a life of happiness in heaven, the rites of proper to Mithraism were held to be exceptionally efficient and important. The Mithraic priesthood, we don't know much about, but they had their priests, 
and the highest of the one was called the Father of Fathers, the Peter Patron, Potter Patras. And if my memory serves me right, Mithra there puts a mark on the foreheads of his soldiers, which by the way was a cross. Uh, he also wrote, the differences between Mithraism and Christianity can be quickly summed up. Belief in the immortality of the soul, which, by the way, was not a belief in the original Catholic Church, and is not what the Bible teaches. You know, Protestants claim sola scriptura, but immortality of the soul is not what the Bible teaches, and it was not a belief in the original Catholic Church. Anyway, this resembles between Mithraism, which is the summarization, immortality of the soul, heaven. Mithraism taught heaven. The Greco-Roman Catholics teach it. And here's something from uh, another Roman Catholic priest. This is written in French and translated into English. Mithra, identified by the invincible sun. They held Sunday sacred. They celebrated the birth of the sun on December 25th, the same day which Christmas had been celebrated since the 4th century. They both ad admitted the existence of heaven inhabited by beatified ones situated in the upper regions. And finally, they both believed in the immortality of the soul. So we have two Roman Catholic writers saying basically the same thing. But what they forget to tell you is original Catholics did not believe that they went to heaven upon death. Now, I'm going to read a prayer that the people of the Mithra faith had to say. If you want to become an initiative, you want to join the Mithra faith, here's what you're supposed, one of the things you're supposed to pray or say. Be gracious to me, O Providence and Psyche, which the great god Helios, that's the god of the sun, the great god Helios Mithras, or ordered to be revealed to me by his archangel. So they're claiming they got a message from an archangel. Remember the Apostle Paul, or I should say the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians says, even if you get a message from the angel of heaven, if it's a deviation from the true gospel, don't go for it. Okay, but for Mithra, you had to say, yeah, it's revealed by an archangel. So that I alone may ascend into heaven as an inquirer and, to behold, and behold the universe. So this is kind of interesting because uh, they're supposed to go to heaven, the Mithra people, so then they can behold the universe. Kind of reminds me the idea that people think when their relatives die, they're up there in heaven looking down on you. Mithra people, that's what they prayed. And again, that's what a lot of people commonly believe and what's been commonly taught. Now, I mentioned uh, uh, the late Dr. Herman Hay before. Uh, I'd like to see, read something else that, uh, that he wrote. Uh, I met him on multiple occasions. Anyway, he wrote, Did Jesus say Christians go to heaven? Many believe that Jesus told his disciples that Christians spend eternity in mansions in heaven, and they quote him. And we, we talked about these mansions and rooms uh, before. And then he uh, goes down here and says, you know, Revelation 21.2 makes it plain that God's holy city, his house, is going to come here. So since he will make his place a future residence on the earth, one of the, it's one of the two things Jesus is praying now in heaven. Both God the Father and his Son have been fashioning it since whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Since the city comes down out of heaven fully prepared, then it must have been prepared in heaven, just as Jesus said he would do. The city comes down from heaven. It doesn't say that we go to heaven. Let's understand what the Bible says about the kingdom, which is will come to earth. Jesus returned to heaven to receive a kingdom. He must be preparing it while acting in the office of high priest, since that kingdom is prepared for all of us to inherit. Then a particular place Christ is preparing for each of us must be our own position and rank in office in that kingdom. Place means position, office and rank, as well as geographical location. The kingdom of God is the government of God, which members are to be born of God, being born of God, makes the entire kingdom then the family of God. 
Except you be born of water and the Spirit, you can't see the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus said in John 3, 5. That's why Jesus used the ancient temple as physical type, the spiritual family of the kingdom of heaven. We could not receive the Holy Spirit, the only means by which we can enter the kingdom, until Christ ascended, John 16, 7. Christ prepares places for us, for then. If Christ wasn't our high priest in heaven, the kingdom would not be prepared, and we wouldn't have the offices. Although Christ had to go to heaven, he said, I go to prepare you a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you will be also. And he's coming back to the earth. So that's what uh, Herman Hay said. And Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 12 said, Rejoice and be exceedingly God, uh, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets before you. Now, I should have read the previous verse, which says when they say all kinds of bad things about you. And if you want to look on the internet, you can see all kinds of bad things said about me, uh, as well as uh, some of the other uh, uh, Church of God leaders, particularly in the continuing Church of God. And Jesus said we're to be exceedingly glad because great is our reward in heaven. But even our reward is in heaven, it's coming down to the earth. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11. Starting in verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kings of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were set before God on the throne of heaven fell on their faces and worshipped, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, the one who was, the one is to come. Notice he's going to come to the earth. Because you've taken your great power and reign, the nations are angry, your wrath has come, at the, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. You should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And in Revelation 22, verse 12, you don't have to go there. Jesus said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. So Jesus said, I'm coming, and my reward will be with me, to give to everyone according to his work. Um, and as I mentioned before, I do believe Jesus' words and other scriptures support the idea that Christians will spend some time uh, in heaven. Uh, for example, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But they will later reign on the earth, as it says clearly in Revelation 5, verse 10. We know God's throne is going to come to the earth. I believe that through eternity, God is going to have his uh, children in various places throughout the universe, because there's a purpose for all the planets and everything else out there. I mentioned this book before, The Mystery of God's Plan. Why did God create anything? Why did God make you? But as far as the reward of the saved, the Bible does not teach heaven per se, but that the kingdom of God will be on the earth. Now, I titled this uh, sermon, The Plain Truth About Heaven. So let me go back to the old Plain Truth magazine, something else Herbert Armstrong wrote back in 1955. The reward is not heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So that's part of the Sermon of the Mount. You know, going through what Herbert Armstrong wrote. And certainly every Christian must believe the Sermon on the Mount. As a matter of fact, it's reading the Sermon on the Mount, in my case, that got me to consider that uh, being brought up as a Roman Catholic was not consistent with what the Bible taught. And that led me on the path to uh, become a part of the Church of God. And um, I still consider myself a Catholic, but because I hold the original Catholic belief, not the belief of the Church of Rome. But anyway, it was the Sermon on the Mount that persuaded me that I needed to look more in the Bible as far as what Christianity is supposed to be. Anyway, Herod Frank says, every Christian must believe the Sermon on the Mount, therefore we've got to believe if we're Christians that what, what the saved inherit is the earth, not heaven. Jesus said, no man will ascend up to heaven. David was a man after God's own heart, He's going to have the promise of ruling the kingdom of God, ruling over Israel under Christ. Christ will rule all nations. But Peter said, Acts 2.34, David is not ascended to heaven. Now, if you want, you can go to Proverbs 10, verse 30. Which is just one short verse. 
Go down to something, right? The wisest man who ever lived was inspired to write as part of the divine word of God, Proverbs 10, verse 30. The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. I think most of you read these scriptures. That's the thus saith the Lord on the question. So we see that the wicked don't inherit the earth. Obviously, the righteous would. There is absolutely no scripture in the Holy Bible that promises heaven as a reward as the saved shall inherit. And yet, haven't most people just sort of blinded their minds to these positive, plain statements from God Almighty and take, cursely taken for granted without questioning the idea of going to heaven? Now, when the kingdom shall be inherited, when the heirs of the promise to Abraham shall finally go to their, get their reward and receive the actual inheritance. When is that? He says, let's go to Matthew 25, verses 31 and 34. So he wrote, quoting this, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his holy angels with him, then he shall sit down on the throne of his glory. Then shall the king say unto them, his right hand, Come ye who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Yes, the kingdom of God is a place prepared. Jesus said he went to prepare a place for us. He also said he went to get himself a kingdom and to return. And when he returns as king of kings and that kingdom is established, that place will have been prepared, then it's for that joyful call goes out. Come bless you all of my father. Of, come ye blessed my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. As I say, Christians taught that they were going to reign on the earth. And... Let's go to the book of Daniel. Even in the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel saw Jesus and the Father would come down to the earth. Daniel 7, starting in verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heavens. He came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. That his dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one that which will not be destroyed. Now, I want to go to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting verse 20. The Apostle Paul was inspired to write, but now Christ has risen from the dead, and he's become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now, he could have said, well, since Jesus resurrected, all everybody's alive who died in Christ. He did not say that. He said that each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards those who are Christ is coming. And then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. He must reign till he puts all enemies under his feet. Well, all enemies are not yet under his feet. The kingdom of God is not yet here, but it will come to the earth. The plain truth is there's no verse in the Bible that teaches that heaven is the reward of the saved. The doctrine of heaven is a fantasy adopted from paganism, and some people wanted to tell their kids and others this, but it's simply not true. It's not that there's no heaven, but those who look for it as the Lord that has saved generally do not understand God's got a different plan, which we go to, for example, in this particular book, The Mystery of God's Plan, Why Did God Create Anything? Why Did God Make You? In this book, and the other ones we talked about are available at ccog.org, as is, by the way, or book it on the Gospel of the Kingdom of God, which is available in over a thousand languages. Christians taught to be resurrected, to be in the Kingdom of God. That's what the early church taught. Sadly, there's a lot of misinformation about heaven. There, were, there are three heavens. The one where the cloud is, the first one, outer space, the second one, where God's throne is, which is a spiritual location, which does tr truly exist, of course. Those who are willing to be taught led by God and believe his word and look at history of the early church, for example, which we talk about here, can prove early Christians did not believe that they would go to heaven. The plain truth is they believed they would be resurrected. 
And early Christians believed and looked for the coming kingdom of God, uh, which will include all the heavens, will be based on the earth. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what we need to continue in Church of God teach. Again, believe the Bible and not fantasies of various ones who have other day ideas. The Bible and church history demonstrate the plain truth is early Christians and True Christians this day do not believe that heaven is the reward of the saved. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.